And when you tell people that you are in need of Jesus, repent for your sin grips you and your sin condemns you and your sin sets the agenda away from God for you. Whenever you preach like that, whenever you reveal these truths that apply to every single man and woman and child, no matter who they are, where they are and what time epoch or time frame they function, people will take offense. Good morning, Clement Baptist Church, and uh, welcome again to Sunday morning worship, um, recorded live here at the Clement Baptist Church facility and campus. Uh, if you are watching as a guest, we welcome you, and we're so glad that you are joining us. And you are joining us on the first installment of a new series that uh, we start today. The series is entitled, A Hill to Die On. I'm going to explain that just a bit for you. Um, you've often heard it um, said that you should not die on this particular hill, uh, which is referring to some type of uh, scaling of importance of what issues uh, to really kind of get behind or what to let slide. Uh, most issues seem to be the ones where you should not die on this hill. And I'm not going to elaborate on what those issues are today, um, in fact, my, my interest in this particular series is really to speak into and define um, what are then the issues that we should die for. Um, and so today is just an introductory message, an introductory sermon, uh, with the big idea that truth is a worthy um, asset and worthy ideal, uh, a worthy facility uh, to die for. Um, there are plenty of things that uh, we shouldn't be too concerned about and just allow the agreement to disagree to uh, prevail. Uh, but when it comes to things of an eternal nature and things which kind of mutate Christianity away from its core beliefs and truths, uh, then we need to take a firm stand. And I'll be preaching a series of sermons, and today, as I said, is the introduction. Um, and from next week onwards, we will look at some of these um, core doctrines and core truths that... Uh, define our faith across denominational lines. And any one of these truths which are mutated or um, treated with disrespect to the degree that its impact on the overall character of our faith is diminished, um, we need to be careful about that, and I'd like to define that and speak to that. So next week, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we look at the truth to die for, which will be the Trinity, the fact that we serve one God in three persons or a tri-unity, if you wish. Um, I have recently uh, been in touch with some people who mentioned to me that they are confused by the Trinity or the doctrine thereof, and in fact, um, confused to such a degree that they don't know where to turn to, and I've counseled and, and, and uh, have been teaching on it. And it brought to my mind that there are probably thousands, if not millions of believers all over the world who are confused on this particular uh, key and core doctrine. I've also come to the um, conclusion under the realization that I have heard very little sermons on this issue from, from a church pulpit, a seminary chair, I've heard it plenty of times, uh, from a cell group Bible studies a few times, but from the pulpit, it's nothing more than a passing comment um, or a pithy saying which affirms the Trinity. But in terms of deep teaching, um, not much from the pulpit. And I don't want to be guilty of that myself. And so we'll be looking at that next week and then after that a few others as well. Uh, if you're watching online, you um, are missing the musical worship uh, that we have just um, been engaged in, and even our songs and hymns have been centering around this idea of creed, of truth, uh, and of fidelity to God's word. And so I thoroughly enjoy that, and um, unfortunately, if you're watching online, you've missed that. So turn with me to John chapter 8, and we'll be reading from verse 31. It's a well-known passage, and it contains at the core of it what is truth and how does it operate, and in fact, who is truth. So we'll answer all those questions, but follow me please now as well. John chapter 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. 
Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abram's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abram's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you that I have seen what I have seen in the Father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. May God add again a blessing to the public reading and exposition of his word. I do not intend to keep you long, but I do have some weighty information for you this morning. I want to start off and preface the points I'm going to share with you by this introductory remark. That the truth is cornerstone to our spiritual, our mental, our emotional, and our physical health and well-being. Without the truth operating as the cornerstone of our existence and our reality, things become a lot more difficult to balance in our lives. The truth is the ultimate canon or measuring stick by which we can measure our very own reality. And when the truth becomes something that is relative, and the truth becomes something that shifts like the sands of time and changes according to attitudinal adjustment, then our reality becomes very difficult and hard to deal with. Now, having said that, I want to turn your attention to the passage we've just read. Uh, there, are very, uh, there are two very famous uh, portions of this passage, and the first one is uh, that uh, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Uh, that is verse 32 of chapter 8. Um, and the other one is about the work of the truth himself, the person of the truth, uh, about Jesus, and he says that um, he who the Son sets free, which is the truth, will set you free indeed, which is true truth, leads to true freedom. Or ultimate truth will lead to ultimate freedom. So I want to share with you a few things uh, about this, and don't let this share you, but I need to tell the truth. I am preaching about the truth today, after all, isn't it? I've got one, two, four, six, eleven points for you today. So buckle in, this might be a long ride. Only kidding, we'll keep this as short as possible. So I want to give you three major points from uh, two very important verses right at the beginning. It's verse 31 uh, to verse 32. And you know this, you've heard this quoted in many revival settings and in many fiery sermons about the truth setting you free. And so uh, here we go. It says this, To the Jews who had believed him, those who uh, are firmly in the camp of Jesus, uh, he said this, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 
So based on those two sentences, allow me to extract three major earth-shattering ideas. And these uh, are heels to die. And the big idea is just establishing the thought pattern for the rest of the subsections of doctrine, which are uh, foundational and unavoidable if we want to call ourselves Christian. That which we must believe to be termed a Christian. And so uh, these truths... Um, are vitally important as the concept of truth itself is. The first one is this, that you need to hold to the truth. Um, th this, uh, I, I, and, and this refers to an energy that is expended, um, an action of faith and belief that uh, is done uh, by the person that's confronted with the truth. Now, of course, it speaks to the faculty and the ability to decipher truth, to recognize truth when it does come before you. And you'll notice a bit later when Jesus is talking to the Jewish leaders and the Jews who do not believe him. At this point, this is to the people who do believe him. But later on, there are religious leaders and others who don't believe Jesus, and they don't hold on to the truth. The first thing that they do is they question the truth, much like I mentioned last week in my sermon, Genesis chapter 3, where their faith is questioned and the nature of God is questioned. Did God really say that? And so they question truth. The second thing that they are doing is that they are saying there is an inability uh, to recognize even the obvious claims of the truth. Jesus had performed many miracles. They, in their culture, they understood that e either you are from Beelzebub, the devil, or some other ungodly power, or you are from God to do what you are doing. Those were the only two options that they had. Jesus could not be uh, um, thrust into the category or into the box of a sinner because no one had any evidence that Jesus had done anything wrong. And so they couldn't even place that on him. But with all the evidence which included the level of his spiritual and ethical teaching, the depth of his understanding of the covenantal word of God in the Old Testament, and the new teaching as he applied it in the Sermon on the Mount and so forth, and his philosophical, theological underpinnings uh, that we find in the Gospel of John, blows their mind and they understand that they're in something otherworldly. But they still refuse to acknowledge the truth. They refuse the truth. They uh, uh, question the truth, and eventually, of course, they just flat out reject the truth. You are called to hold on to the truth as a believer. And that is the very teachings of Jesus. I notice that it has become quite fashionable um, in recent decades to try and hold on to Jesus, but not on to his teachings. And you cannot do that. It is a... Um, a great disservice at the least, and it is one of the greatest sins at the most, to hold on to what we call the presence of God and yet reject His truth, whether it be the moral, the ethical, or the straight-out biblical exposition of Jesus' mouth Himself. Because we are uncomfortable with it at a cultural level, or because it is somewhat um, uh, uh, you know, uncomfortable on a personal level relating to my own sin, I like to Cut out the pieces that I don't like of the teachings of Jesus, of the demands of his commands, of uh, the precepts of his very word. And it has become commonplace for people to re-explain, re-engineer, and redefine the very word of God so that I can become comfortable with it. I would like to remind you again that the truth is supposed to change you and I. We are not supposed to change the truth. It's as Augustine said, the truth is to be discovered. The truth cannot be created by man. So the truth is the truth. And if the truth is the word, and the word is Jesus, as this very gospel says in its first chapter and its first verse, then you understand that you do not create truth. You do not speak truth, nor can you declare truth into existence. But you discover truth as a grace leading of God to a certain set of facts which ring true to a certain presence which is the presence of God. You, my friend, I need to hold on to the truth. I pray that God has revealed his person, which is truth. And I pray that God has revealed his teaching and his words, which is equal truth, to you. May you hold on to it my friend. Number two, so not only should we hold on to the truth, because he says, if you hold on to my teaching, which is his truth, 
And then he says, you are really my disciples. And I find it interesting the language that Jesus is using. He says, then you are really my disciples. And what he's saying is, when you hold on to my truth, it influences your actions. So, having the truth. So, you, you, this is the encouragement to hold on to it. And then, having the truth is a definition of what discipleship is. Now, in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are but jars of clay, vessels who contain the treasure of God, which is the presence of God. Do you not know um, that you carry the presence of God within you? Now, uh, if you had noticed this vessel before me, it is a transparent glass with some water in it. And um, it is impossible for this glass to hold the truth, the water, the liquid inside it, without it getting wet. Wetness and water are a package that cannot be separated. You will be changed when water gets on you. Now, we carry the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, and the very presence of truth, the presence of Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit within us, if we are true believers. And this truth, as we hold it, uh, seeps through our very bodies and uh, manifests through our actions, and discipleship is then the result. Other people look and they see and they say, listen, are you a Christian because you act a little bit different from us? I was chatting to our youth leader yesterday and uh, just kind of talking about some issues, a little bit of discipleship included in there. And he said to me, he was with some people who weren't believers and they were just joking around and talking and so forth, having a good time. And the one person says to him, are you saved? And he says, yes, but why do you say that? He says, now I can see. And long story short, there was just something different about him being in a group of people who don't keep Jesus as premium in their life and their lifestyles. And even though the topic of discussion was not Jesus, was not salvation, was not any topic under theology, they were just talking about sport, making clean fun and jokes. And uh, they realized that this young man is slightly different. You cannot be unchanged by the presence of truth in your life, which is the Holy Spirit, the presence of Jesus. You have to have the truth, and it's going to work itself out in reality by making you a true disciple of Jesus Christ. If you don't have the truth, you cannot truly be a disciple. So, hold on to the truth, my dear friend. Number two, having the truth defines discipleship. You have got to glorify in the truth. The disciples who try to redefine truth to fit their own lifestyles are no disciples at all. In fact, they might be goats in sheep's clothing. And I say goats because they're not exactly wolves trying to fool anybody. They're simply goats who might not be regenerated by the Spirit yet, but they want the status of believer and the benefits of believer without making the sacrifices and the submissions of a believer. Number three, so you hold on to the truth. You Having the truth defines your discipleship. And thirdly, that human freedom is achieved by the truth. Listen to uh, what verse 32 says of chapter 8 of John. So, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, once you hold on, once you are being discipled by the truth inwardly and it's coming out in terms of your action in the real world, you will truly be set free. Human freedom, my friend, is achieved by the truth. You see, some of you think that you are truly free. If you can escape physical punishment, if you can escape sometimes the worldly dishonor that is thrust upon Christians throughout this world, in many cases, when people find out that you are a true follower of Jesus and a true Christian with very firm moral, ethical, and spiritual convictions, that there is an exclusivity to your theology that says, unless a man be born again, he shall not enter the kingdom of God. It's an exclusivity that says that Jesus, the one that I serve, love, and worship, is the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and is the only way by which man can come to the Father. When you understand that that's who you are and they get it then ridicule maybe even persecution but removal from uh, that 
portion of society is very often uh, the result of your experience. People are uncomfortable with those who uh, contain the truth and make the truth known. I want to encourage you, my friend, that true freedom is not the freedom to be accepted, is not the freedom uh, to do whatever you want to, is not the freedom of consequences of sin. True freedom is to be found in the truth which is the gospel, the truth which is the teachings of Christ, the truth which is the very presence of Christ himself. So just to recap very quickly, just from these two verses, we learn that we should hold to the truth. We learn that having the truth defines our discipleship, our walk with Christ. And number three, that human freedom is achieved by the truth. You could be locked up and more free than the people walking outside in the garden. You could be in the garden and without Jesus, you could be more imprisoned by your conscience, by your thoughts and the consequences of your very own sin. I trust and I pray that you are uh, finding premium value in the truth of God today. And if you are not, I pray that you come to um, establish the truth in your own life very soon. Let's continue. So the next three points uh, are from verses 33 to verses 38 of the passage I just read. And the first point is this, of the second section at least. That physical freedom is of great value. But freedom from sin is of eternal value or ultimate value. So, uh, look at verse uh, 33. It says here, We are Abram's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if a son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abram's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Now, physical freedom is of great value. In the same way that the Apostle Paul says that, listen, physical exercise is of great value. However, the practice of the spiritual disciplines and the spiritual exercise like prayer, meditation on God's word, uh, memorizing uh, God's word and fasting and all these other um, spiritual practices and facilities that uh, we encourage people to do as Christian believers, they are of greater importance. You're practicing your faith in relationship with Christ himself. You want to go deeper in relationship with God. And so even though physical freedom is something to be aimed at, and I, I want to stop right here, and I want to say a very contextual word to all those who are listening to me. If you are viewing this outside of my national context, I am in Cape Town, South Africa, um, and uh, a lot of what I'm about to say applies here, although it might apply to your um, uh, geographic area as well. Uh, but like most of the world, uh, we are experiencing a limited lockdown at the moment. In March this year, 2020, we experienced a hard level 5 lockdown, which means we couldn't even leave our homes uh, only to get supplies, which was very stressful on us personally, on us mentally, uh, but also very stressful on us as a nation economically. And great need came out of this particular lockdown, the likes of which we are still suffering from right now. And... In the midst of all of this, the old challenges of racial tensions, the old challenges of old leftover oppressions from my, uh, our previous dispensation still existed. And now you've got this new COVID lockdown induced pressures. It just added pressure to pressure as well. And so there were people who were no longer legally oppressed, but they were economically uh, downpressed um, and economically uh, very much needy. I have made it part of my focus to try and assist the physical freedoms of all peoples. And uh, I desire to see people, irrespective of religion, whether they are Christians or not, uh, irrespective of race, um, irrespective of demographic or class, um, but I desire all people to be equal uh, before the law and all people to have at least equal um, access, uh, not necessarily opportunity, that's a discussion for another time, but um, everybody should at least be equal before the law. 
Um, and so it's, it's a big part of, of who I am. But I want to say that with all the striving that we put forward to getting the fetters and the chains off of political or economic oppression, or the leftovers thereof, nothing comes close to the great importance of spiritual freedom. Freedom from sin. You see, the freedom of all of these uh, economic freedom and political freedom and legal freedom, uh, physical freedom, uh, all of these things are temporal. But eternal spiritual freedom is that just that. It's eternal. It lasts forever and a day. And that's the freedom that we should be pursuing. Our relationship with God and our relationship with the truth, which is His truth. Second thing I'd like to say in this middle part of the sermon is that a lack of truth is often related to murder. And our times in these days almost bear that out. Uh, if People don't agree with you and, and uh, you know, people speak about my truth and your truth as if it's something that's relativist, but it, it, it's not. And, but as soon as people disagree, uh, violence very often ensues. This dear continent of ours um, has been wrecked by people who disagree, who have got different understandings and different perspectives, and just because of their disagreement, murder and killing on a large scale would follow. And so I want to encourage you uh, to understand that physical freedom is great, but uh, eternal freedom is of uh, much greater importance. And then a lack of truth often relates to murder. People get angry when others can't see their viewpoint. Um, and very often that anger gets turned into uh, some type of physical harm that you want to aim at what you consider your opponent. I want to say to Christians, we don't have to act that way. We've got Jesus on our side and he fights our battles. That doesn't mean that we don't make an argument, we don't make a defense for our positions, but we never resort to violence. Uh, we stand for the truth and if it's a hill we need to die on, if it's this important, then maybe so be it. Um, but we don't have to resort to violence. That's what other people do. Listen to uh, what Jesus says to these religious leaders who don't believe Jesus. He, so he says, look, if I set you free, you will be free indeed. And he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. You see, a true believer, one that is saturated by the truth and the word of God, it's not going to plan in their heart to murder someone or kill someone just because they disagree. You see, Jesus uh, holds us to a higher standard, and there's two things that we'll do. The first thing is that we can pray for you. And if we feel that you have a, 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 an agreement with untruth or with lies, well, we, we can pray for you, and, and we can ask God by His grace to intervene. Um, the second thing uh, that we can do is we can bless you because God has blessed those who disagree with you or consider themselves your enemy. We truly don't have any enemies from our perspective. We're supposed to get along with everybody as far as this possible. But where it's not possible, we should not be the, the originators of the conflict and we should not be the people who perpetuate it. But you will find yourself in those situations and you will bless your enemies and those who disagree with you Nonetheless, that's what we are called to do. But we will not plan, and we will not scheme, and we certainly will not try to murder or harm anyone. That's the work of the devil and his children. And then, last but not least, there is a relationship between what you believe is the truth and, again, how you act. Now, this lines up with the, the third point or the second point uh, of that first section, which is having the truth defines discipleship. And so you've got to understand that if you lack the truth, usually evil is going to be the consequence. If you have the truth, usually holy action is going to be the consequence. I'm busy reading uh, Jerry Bridges' the second installment right now um, of his book. His first book was called The Pursuit um, of Holiness. And his second book is called The Practice of Godliness. E excellent reads. Please go ahead and, and buy it and read it. And essentially he says, the quotient of truth in your life will relate to your holiness and your godly, godliness in your hands and your feet, in your actions. So let's move to the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen. We're almost done. But I want to share with you, in conclusion, the um, anatomy of untruth according to John chapter 8. 
And this anatomy is also something that I notice in the political world today and even just in the social world today. Uh, it rings through. I just smiled uh, when I saw what uh, in John chapter 8, and I thought to myself, my goodness, in 2,000 years, this um, human indicators of untruth in society and in ourselves still rings through. So let me give it to you, and, and, and this is it's all from John chapter 8, uh, the entire passage I read, verses 31 to 47. And so the first thing is this, the anatomy of untruth. So the first level is there's going to be disagreement. And in this case, it's, of course, disagreement with Jesus. Um, I, am, um, I am at the position where, you know, you can disagree with me, and I, I really don't care. I think, you know, the older you get, the more stubborn you get. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. But on the other hand, the older you get, also the more secure you get. I, I don't need your affirmation. I don't need your agreement. I know what I know. The Bible is the Bible. The truth is truth. And whether you agree with it or not is really uh, irrelevant to my practice of my own life because I base it on Jesus and his truth. But the first level of untruth is going to be disagreement. And they're going to disagree with you, especially if you disagree with Jesus. If you agree with Jesus and you're simply echoing his thoughts, uh, which is another definition of discipleship. We do what he does, we say what he does. But there's disagreement. Now, um, this is disagreement and it's also lies. Sometimes the two are not the same. In this case, it is the same. Because I can disagree with you and it could just be another portion or perspective of the truth, something that me, my limited capacity, I kind of miss and you bring a disagreement, uh, which is equally truth, but maybe paradoxical or different. In this case, it's disagreement, which is also a lie. And so uh, look here to what they say. So Jesus says, um, you know, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now, they disagree with Jesus, and then they lie to back up the disagreement. And I've heard people say this all the time. You see, they can't just disagree. They need to get some type of source or some type of evidence to make their statement uh, weightier and more authoritative. But the very thing they are quoting or referring to is a lie. The source is a lie. So they say, listen, but we are Abraham's descendants. So they start at the low level. And we and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Now, again, there is a term, if you, especially if you're watching, uh, kind of watching American politics these days. And I, um, you know, I pride myself in trying to keep myself abreast of not only what happens in Africa, but even in Europe and the United States. And this term has become synonymous with the election uh, in the United States. It's called fact check. In other words, if you're going to talk in the context of my sermon, truth check is what you are saying true. And thank the Lord for the internet that these days so, so, such good records are being kept about what people say and what they've recorded in the past and, and, and what their track record is. That it's not that difficult to fact check and see if someone has actually said what they said, uh, if someone has voted the way they voted, especially if it's a political uh, appointee or representative. All those things are public, uh, publicly recorded these days and we have access to that information. But they disagree and they make a comment as if Jesus wouldn't know this. First of all, he's the son of God and he would know this. But also he's a Jew who is steeped in the history of the Jewish people. So he would know this even if he wasn't the son of God. And they say, listen, we are descendants of Abraham. We've never been under oppression or slaves to anybody. Now, they have been under oppression under numerous foreign powers throughout the history. Uh, uh, just after Abram's day, and Abram went through a few wars himself, and Abram had his own men in his own little militia, little army that he would travel with um, as he grew in stature and so forth, and God blessed him. Um, and there were even uh, one or two occasions where he wasn't under complete uh, oppression, but he was under compulsion. And I won't get into that. But just after Abram, you've got the old Joseph story. And at that point, you know, the, uh, it's, it's the beginning of the seeds of the oppression of the Hebrew people. We're not quite yet a nation. And so eventually they find themselves in Egypt. And they find uh, the need for deliverance from Yahweh out of Egypt. And God raises up this, uh, uh, this young man called Moses, 80 years old, to lead them out. Um, of the territory and the political oppression of uh, this geopolitical power called Egypt and take them to a promised land. So the, right almost in the beginning of their nationhood, they are birthed out of oppression. 
And then through numerous political powers which are foreign to them, they are under the pressing thumb of the Assyrians. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, jo uh, Jonah, the, 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 the prophet, didn't want to go to Assyria, to Nineveh, to preach to them because their oppression still had a major impression in his mind. And so he, he, he disliked, he almost hated uh, the Ninevites and the Assyrians. He didn't want to do that. But later on it was the Persians and the Babylonians. And even at the time where this comment is made, the Roman Empire has set up court, has set up uh, 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 military stations within Palestine and they call the shots and they have even placed the king um, that uh, serves Caesar. They were under foreign political administration. And so this very comment which seems to argue with Jesus, and you know you get these people, if they could just quote the fact, make up a statistic so that they can sound authoritative, they think that it will work, but it doesn't work. And Jesus was able to fact check right there with his divine mind and even with his knowledge of Jewish history, being a Jew himself, he would have known that you are talking absolute nonsense. Have you ever been in the presence of someone who's got the gift of the gab and thinks that if he just uh, uses enough words and quotes stats that no one knows and drops names as if they actually existed these days, I say, while I preach, pull out your phone, Google what I say, check my facts, uh, uh, rip it apart, tear it apart because it will only relate to the quality of preaching and truth that we disseminate from our pulpits. But the first phase is disagreement. The second one is offense, which is uh, the implication of truth. And so the first one is they disagree. Well, Jesus, uh, uh, we have never been under oppression for anyone. How can you say that we must be saved or we'll be set free? They take offense to it. They disagree with it first, now they're taking offense. Uh, why should we be set free? We are Abram's descendants and we have never been saved. How can you say that we'll be, we, sh we shall be set free? You see, uh, when people take offense, there's a denial of their true status before God and before man. They don't even know their own need. And when you tell people that you are in need of Jesus, repent for your sin grips you. And your sin condemns you. And your sin sets the agenda away from God for you. Whenever you preach like that, whenever you reveal these truths that apply to every single man and woman and child, no matter who they are, where they are, and what time epoch or time frame they function, people will take offense. How dare you tell me that I need Jesus? How dare you tell me that I need to be set free? How dare you tell me that I'm lost? How dare you tell me that I'm in need of salvation? First they disagree, and then they take offense. It's the implications of truth when it hits a sinner, when it gets thrust before them, it makes them uncomfortable, makes them itchy, and then they draw offense. Number three, Partial truth is emphasized and then prized. So they realize that just quoting a blatant lie, we've never been under oppression, which is so easy to fact check and so easy to see, they realize, okay, that one's not working. And because they're enemies of the truth, they can't even quote a full truth. They're going to find something, just a little piece of truth that we can mix with a whole lot of lies or untruth, but we're going to overly emphasize this partial truth. Listen uh, to what they say. So they say, listen, um, we are children... Of Abraham. So then Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. That's the partial truth. And Jesus says, I, I can affirm that. I agree with that. And people of the truth are not people who will disagree just because of who you are. We can even affirm the partial truth that you do have, and we see it as something to work with. It's a little glimmer of hope for you. And then he says, Yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. Now I want to draw a distinction over here. And the partial truth that they are referring to is usually positional or factual. So when Jesus speaks about truth, he's, he's talking about facts, yes, because all of Christianity is related to actual historic events, let's call them facts. But it's also related to spiritual realities which are beyond the facts. So in other words, some people, they cannot deny that Jesus existed, and they cannot deny that he, he died on a cross at the hands of the Romans, and they cannot deny that his body can't be found and that the stone was rolled away. But they will interpret all of that to say, well, all of that didn't happen the way the Christian Bible says it happened. There must be some other explanation, and so they come up with that. Jesus is talking about more than just the facts. He's talking about a presence, he's talking about a person, and he's talking about a story, the gospel, which is able to set you free if you but accept and repent. And so 
this partial tooth that these Jews are referring to over here, these non-believers in who Jesus is and in his message, they hang on to this idea that I'm a descendant of Abraham and they find a full security in that. As if that's going to save them. Well, that doesn't save them. And for you just to kind of focus on one or two little facts as if that settles the issue, then it, it points to the, the limit of your, uh, your, your truth absorption capabilities. You're not interested in finding out the truth. You're just interested in establishing a position, strengthening what you already know, as limited as it is, but I'll use the partial truth that I have as my trump card. So we disagree, we find offense, and then we emphasize the partial truth, which are usually facts which can't help us that much. And in this case, it relates to ethnicity. It relates to a sense of hyperbolic nationalism. We are sons of Abram, therefore we must be saved. Forget about repentance. Forget about holiness. Forget about a Messiah that is to come. We are Abram's seed and therefore we must be saved. It's a false foundation to lay your foundation. Number four. And then affirming truth as a must place reality. So Jesus then says this, look, I'm telling you what I've seen in the Father's presence, and you are doing what you have heard from your father. And then they say, Abraham is our father. So that's the first level, all right? Um, when it comes to they disagree, there's offense, and partial truth uh, is emphasized. But now they want to affirm the, the truth in a misplaced reality. Jesus then responds to him, he says, look, you being... Abraham being your father, what does that actually mean? Look at what he says. Now, if you are Abraham's children, then you do what Abraham did. Because he understands that the truth that you hold to relates to a path of discipleship and action. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. And Jesus highlights the inner intentions of their hearts, which... They wonder, how does he know this? How does he know we're plotting to kill him? Because it wasn't made public. This was in the back room of a synagogue somewhere in candlelight, spoken in hush tones. But yet Jesus knows about it. And then they try and escalate. And they affirm this truth. And they say, we are not illegitimate children. They protested, the only father we have is God himself. Now they just accuse Jesus of being blaspheming by calling himself the son of God. And they tried to not make the same mistake. And so they said, but look, we've got a heritage. We are children of Abram. We come from that line. And so Jesus highlights the uh, improper thinking in his response. And he said, but you're actually children of the devil because Abram wouldn't do this. And, the, and then they up the ante and they say, right, let me lie even more. We are children of God. The only father we have is God himself. And then Jesus debunks them Again, so they affirm a truth as a misplaced reality. In other words, the lie gets even more escalated. Do you know people like that? Who will lie even more based upon a previous lie that was ineffective. So let's just lie bigger. Let's lie more frequently. Let's pretend that if we say it enough, then maybe I will believe it and I'll be convincing. And if I'm lucky, then maybe you will believe it. And the last one is that they accuse the truth bearer of lying. And that's the final escalation. So then Jesus says to them, look, if God were your father, he's already told them if Abram was your father, you'd follow what Abram did, and that's not what Abram did. Fact check in your face. Sorry, friend, that's not the truth. Then they say, well, but then God is my father. Let's escalate. And Jesus used the same reasoning. So if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. Not physically, spiritually, they are blinded. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. Notice the equation of the two. Not holding to the truth very often equals murder. For there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Folks, sometimes you'll tell the truth. You'll stick to the truth. And people will not believe you. Get used to it. That's life. It happens. But what tends to happen is, as a knee-jerk reaction that is escalated beyond the norm, the very people who are lying 
are going to affirm to the death that you telling the truth is the lie. You know, uh, one of the most famous sayings in the world when it comes to leadership strategy or war strategy even, the best form of defense is, and finish it for me, attack. And this is when they are threatened and they begin to accuse Jesus of being Beelzebub, Beelzebub the devil. They begin to accuse Jesus of being a Samaritan, one with unpure theology and impure motive. And they begin to, which is an insult to Samaritans also, by the way, because they had the ability to repent and to know God as well. And also, uh, they accuse Jesus of being the chief liar. And so, very often, it, you, you see this degrees of comparison start small with disagreement, it moves to offense, it then goes to emphasizing a partial truth. Then they affirm truth as a misplaced reality, and then they accuse the truth bearer of lying himself. God is a liar. That's what the devil did in Genesis chapter 3. Did God really say this? Code. God is lying to you. He has other intentions. He wants to keep you oppressed when the oppressor is keeping you oppressed. It's classic divide and conquer. Classic misdirection from what's ultimately happening. Folks, don't be fooled. Don't be fooled politically. Don't be fooled here on this earth socially. Don't be fooled uh, spiritually and eternally with what the devil wants to do. I want to tell you that truth is an idea worth dying for. And the ultimate truth is to be found in the words of Jesus and in the presence of Jesus, all contained in both his Old Testament and especially in the New Testament. And I want you to be set free by the truth giver and the words of this truth giver, the gospel. Let me pray a prayer of freedom for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that truth would be a hill that we die on. That firstly, dear Lord, Father, where um, lies have been a part of our, um, of our system, of our reality, let me root it out here. There have been lies that have been told to us that have settled in our souls. Remove it here. Pull it up like the weeds that they are. And then where we have uh, sprayed lies, the Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name uh, to get us to repent and uh, to retract those lies in Jesus' name. Set us free, dear Lord, because you're the only one who can. We ask this for your sake. Amen.